Welcome to Roadmap to Residency. Hello, everyone. I am Aviraz. Welcome to our Cloud 250 Matchmaker Sessions. We will be running through a few questions with you guys to help you in your journey with your 250. So, as I always say, I always read the last line first, typically in this uh, sort of long question stems. So, if this patient's symptoms are caused by an infection, which the falling organism is the most likely cause. Now, we have an understanding that the question is asking us about the cause or the organism behind this patient's infection. Now let's find out what the what infection the patient is actually having. So here we have a 36-year-old immigrant from Peru who comes to the office due to difficulty swallowing liquids. He also has difficulty belching, eating slowly and extending the neck partially relieves his symptoms. The patient has had no fever, weight loss, chest pain, cough, dyspnea, or neurological symptoms. He has no chronic medical problems and takes no medications. He has been an active smoker for the last 18 years, but does not use alcohol or illicit drugs. The patient is afebrile with normal vital signs. BMI is 40, uh, 24. On examination, the abdomen is soft, non-distended, and non-tender, with no masses or organomegaly. Bowel sounds are normal and other examination findings are unremarkable. Barium swallow shows a dilated esophagus and manometry confirms absent peristalsis in the, in the smooth muscle portion of the esophagus. Now, if this patient's symptoms are caused by an infection, which of the following organism is the most likely cause? Now, by reading this question, we went through a range of emotions. But the second last line told us that the patient's uh, esophagus is dilated, plus there is absent peristalsis on manometry. Now, this indicates echelasia cardia, okay? or uh, this indicates the echelasia of the esophagus. Now, uh, the causative organism for the echelasia is the trypanosoma cruzi, right? So this patient who presents with dysphagia and a dilated esophagus has echelasia, now which is characterized by the absence of distal esophageal peristalsis and incomplete relaxation of a hypertensive lower esophageal sphincter. It is most often a primary disorder. However, in a patient from Central or South America, secondary echelasia due to Chagas disease should be suspected. Now, Chagas disease is caused by chronic infection with trypanosoma cruzi, which is a slender C or U sept flagellated parasite with darkly staring nucleus and kinetoplast. Parasitosis related inflammation and immune mediated cross reactivity between the parasite and the enteric ganglia lead to the destruction of the submucosal and myenteric plexus. Now the denervation results in uncoordinated smooth muscle activity, increased esophageal tone and incomplete lower esophageal relaxation. The mechanical dilation proximal to the functional obstruction manifest as mega esophagus. Patients classically experience dysphagia, progressing from the solids to liquids, and then polynophagia due to the food impaction. And also the patient has difficulty in belching, regurgitation, and malnutrition. The other manifestations of Chagas include non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, in which you can see the uh, organism's on histology, or the biopsy of the cardiac muscle, and megacolon. In addition, patients are at higher risk of esophageal cancer. Now let's talk about echelasia. So when there is failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax due to, due to the degeneration of inhibitory neurons in the myenteric plexus of the esophageal wall, that leads to the echelasia, which is generally primary and is idiopathic. But in some cases, it is secondary and arises from the Chagall's disease by trypanosoma cruzi infection or the extraesophageal malignancies, uh, some mass effect or paraneoplastic syndromes. So Chagall's disease can cause echelasia. It presents with progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids and is associated with the increased risk of esophageal cancer. Here you can see trypanosoma cruzi, which are the extracellular trypano, uh, sorry, extracellular trypomastoids. These sort of organisms you can also see in case of the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy due to the uh, trypanosoma infestation into the cardiac muscle. Same organisms are seen. The manometry findings include the uncoordinated or absent peristalsis with uh, increased lower esophageal sphincter resting pressure, 
and the barium cell also is the dilated esophagus with the area of distal stenosis or the bird beak. Now this is the bird beak sign and this is the dilated esophagus. The treatment is surgery and endoscopic procedures like the botulinum toxin injection. Now this concept is also important and can be asked in surgery sort of uh, gastric questions. Now, before we move forward, I want you all to revise the gastric acid production. So whenever we swallow food, it contains amino acids and peptides. And these amino acids and peptides stimulates the sensory neurons. The vagus knob is stimulated. And this vagus knob stimulates the G cells. And this G cells produces the gastrin. And this gastrin uh, stimulates the interocoronal like cells and the parietal cells. Now, these interocoronal like cells produces the histamine, okay? And uh, the parietal cells, they release the acid. And when the acids are released, then you need to balance out these acids. And so these acids stimulate the D cells. And then these D cells release the somatostatin, which then inhibits the G cells and the parietal cells, and hence the acid secretion is uh, controlled, or there is, you can say, the balance between the secretion and the negative feedback. Now let's talk about the gastroesophageal reflux disease. So reflux of the gastric acid and bile into the distal esophagus causing a heartburn is the GERD. It is approximately in the 10 to 20 percent of the adults, and approximately 80 percent of the patient, uh, the pregnant women, have the GERD. Okay, and the risk factors include the uh, in smoking, alcohol, caffeine, fatty foods, chocolate, pregnancy, obesity, and there is uh, the um, most common cause is the transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, which causes the reflux of the acid bile into the distal esophagus. Also, whenever there is the reduced LES pressure, then that can cause the uh, reflux of the acid. Okay. Also, in case of Helicobacter uh, pylori infection, uh, there is no such role in the pathogenesis of the GERD, but they, when, but since there is the uh, increased gastric secretion, then ultimately this can reflux back uh, idiopathically. The clinical findings include uh, retroesternal non-cardiac chest pain, which is caused by the heartburn and regurgitation are the most common complaints. Uh, the heartburn is, is characterized by a painful retroesternal burning sensation that may last several minutes. The regurgitation refers to the backflow of the gastric contents and is associated with the raging and vomiting. And the raging refers to the gastric and esophageal movement of the vomiting without oral expulsion of the vomitus. The dysphagia is triggered by the esophageal spasm. The patient can also suffer from odinophagia. There is nocturnal cough and nocturnal asthma due to the vagus nerve mediated bronchoconstriction. And there is a chronic laryngitis and due to the acid injury, there is uh, the injury due to the enamel, which is also seen in case of bulimia nervosa when the patient is, is deliberately trying to vomit to maintain their uh, weight and all. So the water brass is the sudden appearance of slightly sour or salty food in the stomach, and that cause that can cause the vagus nerve mediated secretions from the, from the salivary gland in response to the acid reflux. The complications include sinusitis, otitis media, COPD, esophagitis, esophageal ulceration or stricture, and buried esophagus. Diagnosis is generally, generally through the 24-hour esophageal PS monitoring and esophageal endoscopy. Manometry can also be used in which the lower esophageal sphincter pressure is generally less than 10 millimeter of mercury. Now, some of the other mortality disorders of the esophagus, we have the diffuse esophageal spasm and scleroderma esophageal involvement. So diffuse esophageal spasm uh, is generally spontaneous or uh, non-peristaltic. Uh, spontaneous non-peristaltic contraction of the esophagus with normal lower esophageal sphincter pressure. So in case of achasia, there is increased lower esophageal sphincter pressure. But in case of uh, DES, there is a generally uh, normal LES pressure. And it presents with dysphagia and enzyme like chest pain, and barium sallow may reveal pox uh, esophagus, and manometry is diagnostic. So, uh, symptoms plus normal LES is equals to the distal esophageal spasm or diffuse esophageal spasm. The treatment is generally due to the nitrate, uh, through the nitrates and the CCBs. The scleroderma esophageal involvement. When the esophageal mu smooth muscle atrophy is there in case of scleroderma, and then there is the decreased lower esophageal sphincter pressure, 
and distal esophageal dysmodality can cause acid reflux and dysphagia. And it can also lead to the buried esophagus and aspiration, and it is part of crest syndrome. So what we knew is that in achalasia, the LES pressure is high. In distal esophageal spasm, the LES pressure is normal. And scleroderma esophageal involvement, the LES pressure is low. So three different things, three different manometric findings, and three different diagnoses. So before we finish, we also uh, do the one more question. So which of the following process is most likely cause of this patient's heartburn? So a 25-year-old woman comes to the clinic due to severe heartburn that is resistant to over-the-counter antacids. Now the patient has no non-medical problems and takes no other medications. She occasionally has a glass of wine with dinner but does not use tobacco or illicit drugs. The physical examination shows scattered telangiectasias on the face, uh, several ulcers on the, at the tips of the fingers and small calcium deposits in the soft tissues. What is obviously the following process is the most likely cause of the patient's heartburn. Abnormal location of the gastroesophageal junction, fibrous replacement of the muscularis in the lower esophagus, increased gas, gastric acid secretion, increased resting lower esophageal sphincter tone, uncoordinated uh, simultaneous muscle contraction in the lower esophagus. So the patient has features of the crest syndrome, that is calcinosis, Raynor phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. The pathogenesis of systemic sclerosis involves the chronic autoimmune inflammation, vascular endothelial injury resulting in chronic ischemic tissue damage and excessive activation of fibroblast leading to the progressive tissue fibrosis. And esophageal dysmotility is a result of atrophy and fibrosis, uh, fibrous replacement of the muscularis in the lower esophagus and the esophageal body and the lower esophageal sphincter become atonic and dilated. And this results in the GERD sort of symptoms. And this also increases the risk of barrett esophagus and fibrous structure formation. Thank you for watching. We will be again back in the next one with another concept. Keep studying hard.